One of the things I told you about all the hormones, and we'll start right now with finishing off auxin, is the fact that auxin and all the hormones are involved in a lot of different things. So unlike animal hormones, where each hormone only does one or a few things, and there's a bazillion hormones, in plants we got a relatively small number of hormones, but each of those hormones does a lot of different things. And as we mentioned in the last lecture, that has to be controlled developmentally. What signal transduction pathway is there, how those cells respond to the hormone in all these different ways is determined developmentally. Okay, so the one thing that we wanted to talk about is apical dominance. So in all plants, or all, now wait a minute, not in, di not in monocots, but in all dicots, at the base of every petiole or lateral branch, there is this um, axillary meristem, an axillary bud. And basically what this is, is a remnant of the shoot apical meristem. That is, these cells in this bud are capable of meristematic activity. But under normal conditions, that meristem, that activity is arrested. It isn't doing anything. And one of the things that people who have known for a long time is if you want a plant to branch more, if you want a flowering plant to produce more flowers, the thing you do is you pinch off the apical bud. And you see what's happening here? The axillary buds have become active, and they're producing new shoots. OK, so the, the, the picture here is that there's some signal that's starting in the apical meristem that is inhibiting the growth of these axillary buds. And when you remove the apical meristem, that signal disappears, and the axillary buds start growing. That all, that's certainly consistent and makes sense. And it also makes sense in the context of the things that we've been talking about, that that signal is auxin, right? That the shoot apical meristem is one of the main sources of auxin in the plant. And the direction that auxin is being transported from the shoot apical meristem is down the axis of the stem. And where is it being transported? Where is that auxin being transported? From the, in what cells? From the shoots to the roots? Yeah, in the parenchyma, but in the parenchyma inside the vascular bundle. So the, the, the phloem parenchyma and stuff like that. Not in the vascular tissue itself. Okay? So let's think about what that means, what you would expect that the response to be at those axillary buds. If the shoot apical meristem is there, what's the auxin concentration going to be in the cells that are conducting the auxin down the stem? High or low? Higher, right? And if you take away that meristem, the concentration of auxin would drop, right? So for a long time, it's been assumed that it is the low auxin that stimulates the growth of these axillary buds. Makes sense. There's only one problem. If you measure the concentration of auxin in those axillary buds in the presence or absence of the shoot apical meristem, in the presence of the shoot apical meristem, the concentration in the buds, in the axillary buds, is low. When you remove the shoot apical meristem, the concentration in those axillary buds is high. How do we explain that? Yes. So the increase in the auxin in these axillary buds after the shoot apical meristem has been removed is a consequence of the activation of those meristems, right? We know that shoot apical meristems normally produce high auxin. So is this the beginning of a signal transduction pathway or the end of a signal transduction pathway? Okay, both. Yeah, right. <laughs> Thank you. That's correct. It's both. But in terms of auxin signaling from 
the original shoot apical meristem, once you've removed it, is the production of auxin in the axillary buds the beginning or the end? Is it the result of the loss of auxin that was being transported down the chute? Yes, of course. So the question is, how does the signal get from the loss of auxin going down the axis of the chute to turning on auxin synthesis and the activation of the axillary buds? Where is the auxin being transported? Not in the phloem. Phloem parenchyma. Okay, so where is that auxin concentration most likely to be sensed? The change in the auxin concentration moving down the stem. Where is it most likely to be sensed? In those cells, right? In the phloem parenchyma, because that's where the auxin is moving, or something immediately adjacent to it. So there must be a signal transduction pathway that carries the information that's responding to that low auxin and carrying the information to the axillary buds and telling them, okay, the shoot apical, apical meristem is gone. You guys are now the shoot apical meristem. Start, start producing auxin. Start producing new shoots. Okay. The details of this are not understood. But the long time held picture that it is low auxin in the apical buds that causes them to take off is incorrect. It's low auxin in the shoot itself. And there's a signal from the shoot to the apical to the axillary buds to start growing. And what is the difference? Can the axil sorry, go ahead, Shanna. Um, so in the first one is in the the one that he just um, said is not true is that they saw because there is an oxygen coming from the um, shoot apical meristem meristem then there's low oxygen in the shoots and low oxygen stimulates um, the growth of the lateral meristems. But it, it's not really like that. It's just there isn't less oxygen. It's not like in in roots where like the signal is like shifted or anything. Like there's a responding signal. That's that's heading in the right direction, but it's not quite there. Remember, if you're going to respond to oxygen increase or decrease in the concentration of auxin. Two things have to be there. The auxin and the signal transduction pathway. Is the auxin that is going down the chute getting to those apical buds? No. It's moving down through the parenchyma. Right? So the auxin isn't going there. The response is in the cells that are seeing the auxin in the parenchyma cells. And that must turn on some other signal that goes to the axillary buds that turns it on. But as I said, we don't know all the details of that. What we do know is it's not, the auxin is not being sensed in the axillary buds. Okay? Right? And this, look at, this is what I mean about thinking about these things. Because how many times have we talked about the response depends upon two things? whether or not the hormone is there, and whether or not the signal transduction pathway is there. If the hormone is not there, it can't respond. Okay? So think through these things from a very general model of the way hormones and signal transduction pathway work. Don't think of these things in isolation. Figure out how it works in the context of a general model. That's what's really important. Okay. One last thing that I'm going to say about uh, auxin because it's a pretty cool uh, experiment. And that is the role that auxin plays in wounding responses. In fact, this picture is showing you two aspects of what auxin is doing. So the red is showing cells where auxin is being produced or where auxin is present. So we can see in this particular wound that auxin is being pr produced all along the surface of the wound. So auxin plays an important response, uh, role in the response of wounding in terms of producing new tissues that cover the wound. That part has been well known for a long time. But the other thing that's, that's going on here is also pretty interesting. Here's a vascular strand that was broken by the wound. And what you see is auxin leading to the development of new vascular tissue that is going to connect these two strands to basically 
work its way around the wound. So two things that are, that are shown in this picture that are important. Oxygen is important in the surface wounding response to produce new cells to cover the wound, but oxygen play, also plays a very important role in differentiation of cells to form vascular tissue. This is present under nor this happens under normal conditions as well as under wounding conditions. What kind, what kind of damage is this? Like how can we see the those symptoms? Like isn't that the new vascular tissue? Is this the new vascular tissue here? Yes, those are, that's the new vascular tissue. But they're showing up because there's auxin present there. So those cells are expressing some reporter gene. I don't remember what it is. But those cells are lighting up like that because there's a reporter gene that's being expressed in those cells that's um, responding to the presence of auxin. Okay, so the textbook talks about a half a dozen other physiological responses of auxin. I'm not going to talk about them all. You can easily read through them and yourself. What I want you to do is understand how those physiological responses fit in the context of what you know about auxin metabolism, auxin transport, and signal transduction and development and gene expression, okay? That's your challenge, is to make sure you understand all of those things. And if you don't, send a question to me by email, come see me in the office, come see Simon, talk with your friends, whatever works, okay? All right, any other questions? about auction before we move on to talk about gibberellins. Okay with auctions? I don't know if this is a silly question, but um, in monocots, do we have any kind of risk of dominance of auction? Where's the, where's the Marisim in monocots? Yeah, it's sitting down in the bottom, right? And all the, so it behaves, certainly behaves differently in monocots. And to be honest, I don't know what the role that auction plays in that is in monocots. I mean, here's where my limitations as a plant physiologist really show up because my background is in physics and chemistry and less in the details of plant biology. So and I don't know the answer to that, but I can find out the answer to it for you. Anybody know? Who's taken? Who's taken botany? Who's taken 3410? Did you talk about that in monocots versus dicots? Okay. Yeah, so Dr. Nicholas would be the person to ask. He, he's likely to know that kind of stuff. Okay, so gibberellins. Um, gibberellins, another big class of plant hormones that many of you ask questions about um, from the readings the difference between how gibberellins work versus auxins work. And so we'll, we'll get to that in just a minute, but this is one of the things that I want you to be doing while you're reading, is thinking about what are the similarities and what are the differences. Okay, so gibberellin was ex gibberellins were discovered by studying stem elongation, very similar to what, how auxin was discovered. So auxin was discovered by looking at elongation of cells associated with phototropic responses in coleoptiles. Gibberellins were discovered by a fungus that happens pr to produce a compound that is a gibberellin that causes rice plants to grow very tall. And so tall that they, they couldn't hold themselves up, they fall over. For the fungus, that's good. Right? If the plant falls over, then the plant is sitting down next to the moist ground. It's a much better environment for the fungus to grow in than if the plant is, plant is standing upright. So as far as the fungus is concerned, that's really useful. Not so good for the plant. But gibberellins were first uh, extracted and purified from the fungal extracts that can cause these plants to, their stems to elongate. Um, an interesting thing is what, um, many of Mendel's mutants on, um, in peas that had different stem heights were gibberellin mutants. We'll talk about some of these in, in just a few minutes. Okay, so that stem elongation, stem height is a, is a key thing associated with gibberellins. One of the things that once gibberellins were, were purified that people found out pretty quickly was that if you take plants that normally have a dwarf phenotype, 
that is short internodes, short spacing between the leaves, and you apply gibberellins to them, two things generally happen. One, they grow tall, and the other thing is that plants that normally grow short, when they, tall, they, when they grow tall, they also flower. Right? So gibberellins are doing two things here. One, they're ca causing the plant to bolt, to increase those internode lengths a lot. But they're also initiating a transition from vegetative growth, which is in most plants is an indeterminate sort of growth, to reproductive growth, produce flowers, and then that meristem is gone. Right? So it's changing from indeterminate to determinate growth. In many dwarf plants, certainly not all, but in many dwarf plants, gibberellins can replace the normal environmental signals that trigger flowering. And so this led people to think that gibberellin plays an important role in plants in transferring that environmental signal, which is perceived in the leaves, to the meristem to initiate flowering. And it turns out that's completely wrong. Gibberellin plays no role in most plants in signaling the plant to flower. So this is a good example of where exogenous application of hormones to the plant gave a response, but that response has no physiological significance. As we see when we talk about control of flowering, the signal that goes from the leaves to the, to the meristems to, to t tell the meristem to produce a flower is not gibberellin. It's a, it's a messenger RNA, in fact. Um, so it's a good example of how you can be steered in the wrong direction by the non-physiological response to exogenous res um, application of a hormone. Okay, and another important thing about the response of plants to hormones, if you take a normal corn plant, normally has long internodes, and you apply gibberellin to it, there's no response. But if you take a dwarf corn plant and give it gibberellins, there is a response. So that tells you something important. What does it tell you? When you read this, what did you think, Anna? Uh, uh, yeah, so that's one thing, right? It must have something to do with the amount of gibberellins that's there and not with the signal transduction pathway that's responding to it. Good. What else does it tell you about the responses to gibberellins? Hemi. That's right. So in other words, there is a maximum in the response to gibberellins that in the normal plants, there's already sufficient gibberellin present to induce this, the stem length that you see. Adding more does not have that effect, right? So it basically says the response, at least in this particular circumstance, is saturable, right? Those are both important characteristics of understanding these particular mutants and their role in signal transduction, right? Right away it tells us that we should expect two very broad classes of mutants in any type of uh, <laughs> hormone. Mutants that are involved in production of the hormone and mutants that are involved in response to the hormone. Why didn't we talk about any mutants in auxin production? We talked about auxin response mutants. Why didn't we talk any, about any mutants in auxin production? It didn't say this in the chapter. We'll, we'll know more about this next week, but can you take a guess? What do we call an auxin deficient, a, a plant that can't make auxin? Dead. Yeah, it's lethal. Auxin is absolutely required for plants to grow, right? An auxin mutant is embryo lethal, can't even make an embryo, okay? So that's why we don't worry about auxin synthesis mutants because you can't do anything with them. You can't study them. Gibberellins, obviously, you can. So gibberellins, you can take away gibberellins and the plants grow. It just alters the morphology of the plant. What determines the maximum plant height? Is it total DNA or? That's a good question. That's a good question. So 
Is it encoded in the DNA? Is the maximum height that a plant can grow to encoded in the DNA? Say that again? It depends. Well, that's not a very definitive answer, is it? <laughs> depends on what? Let's, go, let's at least carry it that far. Depends on what? Okay, so for example, if we think about annuals versus perennials, right? Annuals only grow so much, can only grow, so, they only have a year to grow, right? So that, you could say that determines how big they can get. But how about uh, an oak tree? If it like, goes to a certain height, it's determined by how far water can be pulled and how much pressure, you, negative pressure you need to get the water out. Right, and how much it can withstand wind and... And I think in, like, if you look at a, an annual plant, I guess the architecture would determine how much it can grow and how stable it is. To Good. Grow. So what determines that architecture? That's genetic. That's genetic, right? Okay. So to a large extent, how tall a corn plant will grow in the presence of saturating gibberellins is somehow determined in the DNA. It's probably complicated, but it's there, right? It's also there that how it responds to the gibberellic acid is part of the DNA. But in the presence of saturating gibberellic acid, something else has to be determining how much the plant grows. It's like photosynthesis, right? Even if we give the plant plenty of light and plenty of CO2, there's still a limit to how fast it can go that's determined by the characteristic of some enzyme. In this case, it's got to be something a lot more complicated than that. I was just thinking, what about something like an ivy that like could they grow and grow and grow and grow? Right. Like, that's what I was thinking. Like maybe some plants don't really have a limit, like ivies, maybe. I, mean, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, so most plants that grow upright like this, the limits of how tall they can grow are mechanical, right? What's the, what's the strength of the plant versus the things that would tend to tip it over, right? But for ivy, if it's supported, yeah, maybe you can get ivy to grow, you know, hundreds or thousands of yards long. I, don't, I have no idea. But still, if that's the case, it still has to be somehow those characteristics have to be encoded in the DNA, okay? Okay, so... Um, Gibraltarians are involved in a number of other things. One of the things that we'll see next week, no, week after next, Gibraltarian, um, a number of its functions are antagonistic with another hormone, abscisic acid, ABA. So the relative amounts of gibberellins and abscisic acid play important roles, for example, in um, seed and bud dormancy. These are controlled by the ratio of gibberellic acid to ABA. The higher the ABA, the more likely they to stay dormant, or the seed won't germinate. The higher the gibberellic acid relative to ABA, the more likely this, the bud will break or the seed will germinate. Okay? So the chapter talks somewhat about the role that gibberellic acid has in breaking seed dormancy and also talks about the role that that once the seed germinates, particularly for cereal seeds, the role that gibberellic acid has, and we'll talk more detail about that in just a minute. It's also, we'll, we'll some, may say something briefly about anther development. So gibberellins play an important role in anther development. If you screw up gibberellin synthesis or response in flowers, um, you, get, you get poorly formed uh, anthers and um, pollen doesn't develop, it, doesn't develop it. And as we saw in this picture here, gibberellins can play a role from a non-physiological perspective in causing certain types, particularly dwarf plants, to flower. As I said, that's not what controls it naturally, but gibberellins can replace external environmental signals in causing plants to flower. So if you want your cabbage plants to flower in short days, you spray some gibberellins on it and they, and they flower. Right? Normally cabbage plants require long days to flower. Okay, so it can be used, so for example, in an agronomic perspective to, to stimulate flowering in some types of plants. But don't read that as meaning 
gibberellins control flowering because that is not the case. Okay, so let's think about uh, sort of the chemistry of gibberellins and uh, they're complicated compounds. They're diterpenes, so they're either 20, 20 carbon compounds of the diterpenes. It can lose this carbon to form this interesting epoxide bridge here to form a 19 carbon one. So all the gibberellins are either 20 or 19 carbons. They're derived from the normal terpene biosynthesis pathway in plastids. And they all have this basic four ring structure, one, two, three, and then there's this fourth ring here. So they're relatively complicated in their structure. Um, but they're also all relatively similar in their structure. That is, they all have this basic four ring structure and what gets modified is hydroxyl groups or double bonds and things like that. So in terms of the general shape of the molecule, they're relatively similar to each other. Okay. Yep. My guess is they do, because, it, because it's relatively easy to, you know, you apply gibberell and then you do a microarray and see what, you know, what genes are turned on. But I don't know what the answer to that is. I, I don't know what, what, what's actually causing that. Okay, so if we talk, talk about gibberell and biosynthesis, um, the details of this are not important. But one of the things that you should be doing is thinking about how this diversity, this huge range, so I can't remember what the, I forgot to look it up, I was going to go to the gibberellin website and look to see how many gibberellins have been identified now. Last time I looked, I think it was 146. So it goes from GA1 to GA140 something, okay? The interesting thing is that only a few of them, about a half a dozen, are bioactive. What do we mean when we say bioactive? that some GAs are bioactive and some of them aren't. Textbook uses that term all the time. Well, I got the impression that it had something to do with being able to uh, improve in facilities, or being able to uh, to lock up being transported. Okay, so a couple things. Let's just look at the general structure of, of gibberellins here. Is this molecule likely to be membrane permeable or membrane impermeable? So you said what? It's pretty big, so it's going to be impermeable? Yeah. Or maybe it's not so big. I'm not sure. It's, it's, it's relatively big, yeah. I mean, it's the size of, you know, uh, it's larger than the largest amino acid. But it's not the size of a protein either, right? What other characteristics are important besides size? Polarity. Polarity. Is that polar or nonpolar? Polar. No, it's pretty nonpolar. Yeah, it looks, you know, it's got aromatic sorts of stuff and things like that. They're pretty nonpolar. So gibberellins are membrane permeable. Okay. Did, did you see anything in the chapter about gibberellin transporters across the plasma membrane? No. It's because there aren't any, at least as far as we know. They just move through. So where was the gibberellin receptor that it talked about? Was it on the plasma membrane? Where's that G, G I D1? Cytoplasmic, right? Right, so that's, remember, that's the thing that distinguishes membrane permeable from impermeable signals. Membrane impermeable ones, the receptors on the plasma membrane. Membrane permeable ones, they can be anywhere inside the cell. This one happened to be in the cytoplasm. Okay, so I lost track of what we were talking about here. Oh, bioactivity, yeah. So what, what do we mean by bioactive? The textbook used that term a lot. What do we mean by bioactive? Yeah, that would be a good way to put it. It functions as a signal, right? So it means that these guys are bioactive. They can function as signals. These guys and these guys are not. What does that tell you right away about our picture that we put on the board at the beginning of last lecture about the things that control the distribution of hormones at any given spot in the plant. It pretty much looks like whether the cell has an activator, a lot of them are not bioactive. 
So what would make them bioactive? Well, what what can what changes this to this? It's an enzyme, right? Yeah. Right. So whether the cell has that enzyme or not, right? So if this is what's being transported, if this is what's moving around in the plant, does this have any effect? So which cells will respond to the gibberellins? The ones that can convert this to this, or you can stop the response by converting an active to an inactive one. So this is one of the things that you should be seeing when you read the chapter. The, the book does not spell this out for you, and I don't know why. In this sense, I think it's a very poorly written book. Because the thing that distinguishes, you tell me, what distinguishes what controls the local concentration of gibberellin from what controls the local concentration of auxin? Yeah, transport is what, what matters for auxin. And active versus inactive, what enzymes can activate inactive forms or deactivate active forms is what's important in gibberellins. And it's critically important that you understand that. Right? I wish the book would just spell that out. But at the same time, you should know that's the kind of thing I want you to be looking for to understand. It's not all these gory details of signal transduction pathways. See the big picture. Okay. So the interconversion of these is the, one of the most important things in gibberellins in terms of determining where responses happen. Obviously, they have to have the signal transduction pathway there as well. But in gibberellins, interconversion of active and inactive forms is much more important than it is in auxins. Basically, auxin is auxin, and it's transported everywhere. Right? It's not transported everywhere. It's transported in specific places, but it's always transported as auxin. Okay. Uh, let's see. So the story I just told you, you see this figure in the textbook? Remember this figure? These are mutants along the path of gibberellin biosynthesis. So here's a mutant that's in the very first committed, committed step in, in um, gibberellin biosynthesis of converting geronal geronal pyrophosphate. This is, a, this is the starting point for all the C20 um, diterpenes. So GA1 is right up here at the beginning. It's a mutant in this CPS enzyme that produces the first committed precursor in the pathway. Okay? So let's look at this picture. Mutations along the path. And think about what that means in the context of the, the statement that these are bioactive and these are not. What do you see in the response of these mutants as you go along this pathway? Okay, so somewhere down, the farther are you along the pathway, you have gibberellins that are basically farther along the pathway, right? What about the, the stem height response that you see here? Is it, do you see no internodes, no internodes, no internodes, no internodes, then you get down here to the, to the correct enzymes and you see the right height? Or are these guys bigger than this guy? They're bigger, right? So in other words, what that means, and this is important in an experimental sense, but not as important in a physiological sense, that it's not that these are inactive, they're less active, okay? And if you, as you look through the description of mutants in the biosynthetic pathway, it should be clear that it's not so much that these precursors or these degradation products are totally inactive. They're just significantly less active than the ones that we call bioactive. Okay? That's why I asked that question. Because bioactive doesn't mean no activity. It just means significantly less. Say that again. Isn't that, how, isn't that the term that they use in the textbook to talk about the, the, that the GA1 and GA4 were bioactive and GA20 and GA, 
Um, nine were not bioactive. Did you say bioactive? No, bioactive means significantly more. Did I say it backwards? I, okay. It's dyslexic brain. Thank you very much. Yeah, okay, so that's important. Um, another thing that we can do with gibberellins is pretty much the same thing we talked about in terms of auxin. Use a gibberellin dependent promoter to look at where gibberellins are being synthesized or transported in plants. So this is again a gus promoter, so it's turning that artificial substrate blue. So we can look in five-day seedlings, three-week-old seedlings, and in flowers and in embryos and see that gibberellin is being synthesized in not everywhere, but in particularly in, in um, seeds and in embryos, quite a bit of gibberellin. In mature plants, it seems to be restricted mostly to the vascular tissue, and there's gibberellins that's being, that are being expressed during flower development. Okay, so this gives us some idea under both different developmental states in, in different morphological positions within the plant where gibberellins are being synthesized. So what is it that showing again? The, the blue. The Wherever blue. you see blue. Oh, so like why in the embryos? Why are there some like steps that are yellow? I guess that's, uh, that's a good question. Good question. Good question. I don't know. What's the difference between these guys and these guys? Yeah. I don't know. But it's the blue regions here and here that are important in terms of where the gibberellin is being synthesized. Also oh, in the yellow one, the dark, that's where the blue is. Yep, that's the blue. Oh, okay. Sorry. That makes sense. Yep. Okay, so this, this gives us another powerful tool to think about where gibberellins are either being synthesized or where they're being transported. Okay? And obviously, the physiology that we're going to talk about or that you're going to read about are related to these places where the gibberellins are being synthesized under different developmental conditions. Okay, the last thing is that we can, if we look at a number of the different mutations that Mendel was studying in terms of stem height in peas, three of those, muta three of those mutants that he was studying are related to gibberellin biosynthesis. And interestingly, so there are two mutations the mutation that is the Na mutation, which is way back up here, is up here, causes the ultra dwarf. The LE mutant is further down. It produces slightly taller plants. Here's the normal plant. And then the, the SLN, slender mutant, is actually a mutant in not gibberellin synthesis, but gibberellin degradation. So in this particular plant, Increasing the concentration of bioactive gibberellins actually increases the height of the plant. So it tells us in peas, as compared to corn, the effect of the gibberellin in stem length is not saturated under normal conditions. Right? So if you did the same mutation in corn, we would expect the mutant wouldn't be any taller because adding more G, exogenous GA to the corn didn't make it grow any taller. But in the case of Mendel's slender mutant, it does make a difference. Okay. So we want to talk, I'm um, going to skip this for a second. We want to talk a little bit about um, the signal transduction pathways associated with um, gibberellins. And the receptor that we know about for gibberellins is GID1. It is a cytoplasmic protein that binds gibberellins quite specifically. And clearly, there must be, it must be able to distinguish in terms of its binding affinity between the bioactive gibberellins and the, let's say, less bioactive gibberellins, right? It's got to bind these preferentially less than these. Other, that's, that's what determines why these guys are more, more um, create a larger response than either of these do. Right? It's the affinity to the, to the receptor that's important. Yes? Um, are, those, are any of those steps reversible? Because are any of these steps reversible? Yeah, like from, uh, 
Mm, so could you go from here to here? Or from here to here? Not that I know of. So when you want to inactivate a bioactive form, there is a way to go. Or when you want to activate an inactive form, there is a way to go. But they're, in, they're involving two different substrates. Um, I'm not aware that these reactions are reversible. I mean, this, this is a gross oversimplification of the um, gibberellin biosynthetic pathway. The, the gibberellin biosynthetic pathway is sort of like uh, it's four parallel pathways where, in, where there's four different intermediates along four different paths that conversion from one to the next is catalyzed by the same enzyme. So this one may have a hydroxyl at carbon 17, and this one may lack a hydroxyl, but the conversion that's going on doesn't involve that hydroxyl and versus something else, involves something else. So, for example, the enzyme that's involved in converting GA9 to GA4 and the enzyme that's involved in converting GA20 to GA1 is the same enzyme. These guys only differ in the presence of a hydroxyl group. Right? So the, the, the biosynthetic pathway of these are, are kind of weird. They're, they're very different than the sorts of linear pathways that we've been talking about before. The book doesn't go into this. It used to, actually, um, two volumes ago. It had a very nice diagram of the complicated pathway, and I think they must have figured that, that this confused students. Um, but it is a very messy pathway in terms of synthesis. <laughs> and one of you asked why. Why do you have all these different gibberellins? Well, that's a good question. You know, we've got one auxin, and auxin can do a bazillion different things. Why do we need all these hundreds of different forms of gibberellins when only a few of them are bioactive? And why do you need, is there a necessary necessity to have the difference between GA4 and GA1? It's a good question. I don't think either from an evolutionary perspective or from a biochemical perspective we know the answer to that. Okay, so we were talking about um, the gibberellin receptor, and this is the only one that we know about in, it was discovered in rice because there's a single gibberellin receptor in rice. In Arabidopsis, there are three of them, and obviously that makes studying Arabidopsis mutants in gibberellin signal transduction pathways, receptors any, anyway, a little bit more complicated. And... Here's the figure from the textbook that's showing, here's wild type, and here's the three different mutants are GID1, A, B, and C, right? So single mutants in either any one of these, basically no difference from wild type. So what does that tell us about each of these receptors? What does that tell us about each of these receptors? Eugene, how about you? What does that tell us? The fact that each of these single mutants in either A, B, or C looks the same as wild type. What does that mean? Patrick? They all can do this. They can replace each other, basically, right? If you knock one out, the other two must work just fine because they all look phenotypically the same as wild type. How about if we look at the double mutants? Are they identical as far as the double mutants are concerned? Okay, What's, what are the ones that are important to have? A and C, right? If you have either A or C, it looks fine. But if you get rid of both A and C, then the plant is short. So that tells you B isn't equivalent to A and C. Right? This is the sort of thing that you should be able to, to determine. If I gave you data like this, you should be able to figure out what's going on. Are they equivalent or not? And if they're not equivalent, what is the characteristics of that non-equivalence? All right? So a, a lowercase, um, if, if whatever the genus that you assume is lowercase, it means it's a lack of loss of function. Yes. So yep. So these, yeah, that's what the typical notation means. These, are, these represent loss of function of those particular genes. Correct. Okay? So like... Do A and B or B and C complement each other? Don't 
Uh, yeah, so is that an alternative way of, so you could say it either needs A or C. But can you, this one here, is B functional or B not functional in this one? Not functional. So the, really the only functional gene here is C, right? So that means with C alone, it basically behaves like wild type. So in the absence of A and B, C works just fine. In the absence of B and C, A works just fine. But in the absence of A and C, B doesn't work just fine. So I think an in interaction between the A and B or C and B cannot be, can't, cannot be deduced from this data. Jana. This one here? Yeah. Oh, this one here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this, is a, this is a mutant in the GA biosynthetic pathway. Okay. It's, way, it's way back very early in the biosynthetic pathway. So these are comparing a mutant in the synthesis versus mutants in the response. And so we're seeing that the triple mutant actually has less growth than the, than the one that can't make. This can make very early GAs, but not, not the later ones, okay? So this is a good, good example of how mutant analysis can be used to sort out when there are multiple genes that encode a certain component of the signal transduction, signal transduction pathway. And we'll see this, it's common in Arabidopsis. Why are, why is having multiple forms of a gene common in Arabidopsis. We talked about this way back at the beginning of the semester and you probably don't remember the answer to it. No, it's not specific to Arabidopsis. Yeah, it's related to ploidy, right? So although we consider Arabidopsis to be a diploid, it contains in its genome remnants of two polyploidy events. So if you look back in the Arabidopsis, you know, sort of look at, fit the history of Arabidopsis to some of its neighbors, some of its closely related species, you can see remnants of two um, polyploidy events, where in rice, for example, the last polyploidy event is much further back in the plant's history. So that means Arabidopsis compared to rice is more likely to have multiple forms of genes. When you have a polyploid event, you double everything. And over time, evolution either changes the function of the duplicate genes or gets rid of the duplicate genes. So the longer the evolution has gone on since the polyploid event, the fewer duplicate genes you're going to have. Arabidopsis has two relatively recent ones, and so it's more likely that you're going to have larger gene families in Arabidopsis because of those polyploidy events, okay? So when you compare, when you see three in Arabidopsis and only one gene in rice, that's, that's, the, that's the most common explanation for that. Okay. So let's think about, I want to step back from thinking about the specifics of gibberellin signal transduction pathways to sort of bring something that was talked about in the gibberellin chapter in the context of question five from the exam. So remember question five from the exam? That was the positive and negative regulators that most of you didn't do very well on. So I want to go over positive and negative regulators in the most general sense and then bring them back in the context of the gibberellin. So let's think about where we have a positive effector, something that, that turns on a response that is normally off. So let's think about it like this. Here's a component of a signal transduction pathway. And the normal state of that component in the absence of anything else, is that that, that, um, that 
step is off. Because remember, every step in a signal transduction pathway has to have two states, off and on, right? So there's another state over here, the on state. And there is a process that couples these. Something in the previous step converts this from the off state to the on state, OK? Right, and so on and so on and so on. We're just gonna, so we're just going to look at one step and what's thinking about what's happening in before and what's happening after. So in the case of positive regulators, what's the normal state of the step above in the absence of the signal? Right? So if there's no signal, this is also off, right? So that means in this case, there's no response. The response is turned off. Every subsequent step in the signal transduction pathway and the response is off, right? So this is the case when there's no signal. When the signal comes in, what happens? It's turned from off to on because this guy has been turned on, right? And now we have response. Describe for me the phenotypes, the possible phenotypes of mutants in this, the protein that controls this step of the signal transduction pathway. What are the two possible phenotypes? How about you, Jonathan? What are the possible, two possible phenotypes for mutations? Let's just say this is a protein. We're not going to specify what it is. It's a protein that functions in the signal transduction pathway. What are the two possible phenotypes for mutations in this protein? Uh, OK, so let's, let's not think about it that way. So you could imagine a mutation where the protein's not even made. Let's consider only those mutations where the protein is made. But it, does, it no longer functions in its normal way. What could be the characteristics of those mutants? There's obviously more than one characteristic from the way I'm asking the question. <laughs> right? Yeah, it's important to, to read the professor's questions and understand. Francesca. That's basically it. Always on or always off. So we can imagine a mutation where even when this is turned, the previous step is turned on, this can't be converted to on. That would be always off, no response. Or we can imagine a scenario and even when this protein is off, the mutation is in, causes the protein to be in this state, always on. OK? Got that? Now let's think about the same characteristics in a pathway that involves a negative, re a negative regulator. Let's make sure I get this right. OK, so in the case of a negative regulator, we have the same sort of thing except for it's sort of backwards. That the normal state in the case of a negative regulator is that, am I getting this right? No, I got it backwards, sorry. I don't want to mess you up. It took me a while to figure out how to draw this. That the normal state of a negative regulator Oh, geez, I still got it backwards. I'm sorry. Let me hold my paper right here. <laughs> I don't want to confuse you with this. The normal state of a negative regulator is that it's on, and it's converting an active form 
to an inactive form. That's the negative regulation. The fact that this is on is converting something from the on to the off state. So again, in the absence of the signal with the negative regulator, there's still no response. Okay? So normal way the negative regulator works is to turn the next step off. That's why it's called negative regulation, right? And when the signal arrives, the negative regulator is turned off. It's inactivated, right? That's how we talked about it happening in plants. So in the case when the regulator is off, now the conversion of the on state to the off state is inhibited, and you get the response. Okay? So in the case of a negative regulator, when you turn the negative regulator off, it no longer turns off the next step. Right? And we talked about several different ways that this could be accomplished. By degradation of an inhibitor, by changing the cellular localization, by changing the phosphorylation state, a number of different possibilities there. But relevant to part C of question B, what are the phenotypes of mutations in the negative regulator? They're the same, right? They're either going to be stuck on or stuck off, right? So it's important to recognize that in the case of positive and negative regulators, the outcome of the signal is the same. You're turning it from no response to response. It's being done in different ways. But we can have mutations that affect the normal state and the state in the presence of the signal in different ways in positive and negative responses. So in the textbook, Let's see if I can label these correctly. So in this, if you have it stuck, a mutation, so it's stuck in the off state of a positive regulator. Uh, I can't remember which ones. They, remember in the textbook it talked about four diff, three different cases of mutations? So three of those four map to these guys. I don't know why they didn't include the fourth one. Probably because they haven't found any mutants that fit that description. But this is, this is an example, again, of how I want you to look at the specific information that is given in one of, any one of these chapters in the context of how signal transduction pathways, any signal transduction path, this is a very general model, right? If this doesn't make sense to you, if you don't see how these map to the three different types of mutations that they talk about in the chapter. Come talk with me about it, because those are the things that I think are important. Right? It's not the gory details of everything involved in um, um, gibberell and signal transduction. Yes? So on the positive and negative regulation, yep. found out, these are the regulators, not the signals. And That's so right. How do we think about a signal that has a negative? Good. Like an in Good. So he didn't, he didn't take the exam, so, but that was um, part B of question five. In other words, let's ask the question, how does anything upstream of the positive or negative regulator differ in these pathways? Does it have to differ? No. So the same signal in one cell could affect a negative regulator in one signal transduction pathway and affect a positive regulator in a different signal transduction pathway. The easiest way to think about it is what's one of the most common ways that a component of the signal transduction pathway is turned on or off? Phosphorylation, right? So could phosphorylation turn this one on? Sorry, turn this one off to on and this one on to off? Absolutely. Right? So there's no requirement that there be differences anywhere upstream from this, including the signal. These are just two different ways of regulating a step in the signal transduction pathway. This may be a step that where these guys are transcription factors. 
or maybe a step in the middle of the pathway. Doesn't doesn't matter. Yeah, I, think so. I didn't actually answer the question, I guess, but um, is, there's no speed difference, right? Or, uh, one, it's one, so the book, the, that was a question to me. Right. The book said one's faster, and in my mind, I didn't think it was. Yeah, so I, I made that statement in lecture, I believe, that I didn't see why one was faster than the other. But I asked you to tell me your opinion, but more important, I told you to justify it. And there was a couple of people who said one or the other was faster and gave a reasonable explanation for it. Right? I'm curious what would be a reasonable I don't, I don't, I'm not sure. I, I have to go back and look at the answers. I don't remember what they were. But certainly just looking at something like this, I don't see any reason why one would be faster than the other. I mean, I mean, I mean things have to be like, kind of on the same level, the same number of steps. Everything has to be really synthesized. Because if there's any synthesis, that's going to be a lot slower. Right. Well, a single transduction pathway in which a component of the pathway has to be synthesized is not a single transduction pathway. That's true. It's all got to be there yeah. or nothing happens, right? Okay. So, yeah, in the context of question 5D, my expected answer was there's no apparent reason why they should be different because you're basically doing the same things. Interactions are exactly the same. It's just that one confirmation is off and another confirmation is not. There's no difference in the speed of those. OK, so I spent the time on this because I'm emphasizing how much I want you to, em I want you to think about general models of signal transduction and how they fit into the specifics of what are talked about with any of the hormones that we talk about. Because remember, most of what we know about signal transduction pathways for the specific hormones that we're going to discuss are derived from mutational analysis. Right? So this is important. Understanding how this works tells you how you can go from the phenotype of a specific mutant to what's actually happening in the signal transduction pathway in the protein that that mutant affects. Okay? So if you don't understand this, come talk with me about it. It's important. Okay, let's move on then to talk about the, just um, one component of the gibberellins, another component of the signal transduction pathway in gibberellins that's important. And this is this protein called DELA. DELA turns out to be a very common component of most gibberellin signal transduction pathways. In fact, there are DELA-like proteins in other signal transduction pathways. But what you should see from this picture is the role that DELA plays in controlling, at least in some aspects of controlling, gibberellin-dependent signal transduction pathways is not much different than the role that that AUX slash IAA protein played in auxins. That is, when gibberellin binds to its receptor, that binding causes DELA to, bi to bind to the receptor, which in this whole complex acts as an E3 ubiquitin ligase that sticks ubiquitins onto this DELA grass complex, and it gets degraded. Okay? So this is turning off, removing, a component of the signal transduction pathway. Does this information here alone tell us whether DELA is a positive or negative regulator? Let's, let's have a show of hands. Who thinks, it, who thinks it proves that it's a positive regulator? Who thinks it proves that it's a negative regulator? Who thinks it, it doesn't prove anything? And who doesn't know? <laughs> yeah, OK. It doesn't prove anything. Because you don't know whether this binds to something else and turns it off, or it binds to something else and turns it on. All you know is it's being degraded. Yeah, from that perspective, the fact that it's being degraded tells you once it's degraded, it can't do anything. So whatever it does, it does only in its presence. But does it tell you what it does when it's there? Sure. Not, not, not directly, no. But usually something is there. I mean, uh, if, it was, if it was told it to always turn on the pathway, then yep. the brown will always be active. 
Yeah. That's right. So by that case, Could, be a negative you would expect it to be a negative regular. That's for sure. But it doesn't doesn't prove it. And the reason it doesn't the reason it doesn't prove it, there's an example given in the book. I'm not going to talk about it, but it talks about the interaction between gibberellins and light in hypocotyl elongation, right? And you should look at that and make sure that you understand what the role that Della is playing there is different than the role that Della plays when we talk about cereals and cereal seed germination. So I want to spend just a minute talking about this because one of the things that, that gibberellins is known to play an important role in, and one that's been studied quite a bit because it's an easy system to work with, is the role that gibberellins play in the germination of cereal seeds. We call them cereal seeds because they provide us with cereals. They provide us with uh, flour from rice or corn or millet or those sorts of things. So basically the important is that there's a big endosperm reserve in there that we can use you know, to make flour out of if we wanted to. What does the seed use it for? Yeah, it's basically energy and carbon for growth of the embryo, right? So one of the things that has to happen when a seed germinates is the endosperm has to be mobilized. The endosperm is basically polymers. It's starch or it's proteins. Can the embryo take up starch or proteins? No. The starch has to be broken down to monosaccharides. The proteins have to be broken down to amino acids before they can be taken up by the growing cells of the, of the embryo. So one of the things that has to happen here is that the hydrolytic enzymes have to be produced to break down the polymers in the endosperm so they become mobile and so they become available for the, for the embryo to grow. And the layer of cells in the, in the seed that produce the hydrolytic enzymes is called the alurone. So the alurone layer is the group of cells that is responding to the gibberellins that are produced by the embryo when it germinates and are producing the hydrolytic enzymes that break down the endosperm. So the question is, let's tease apart the signal transduction pathway in the alurone cells that respond to increased gibberellic acid by producing alpha amylase and enzymes that break down proteins, and not just producing them, but they excrete them. Right? They export them from the cell. So here's the figure from your textbook that shows the pathway for starting with gibberellin coming to the cell, and at the end here, the cell exporting by exocytosis, alpha amylase, that then goes out into the endosperm and breaks down the, the starches. Okay? So the signal transduction pathway, we've already seen this part of it, that the gibberellic acid just moves through the, through the membrane, no transporters because it's membrane permeable, gets into the nucleus and binds to GI, GID1. And when it binds to GID1, that causes the degradation of the DELA protein. The DELA protein is a negative regulator of gene transcription, but it's not the negative regulator of the alpha amylase gene. It's a negative regulator of transcription factors. So in the context that we talked about before of early and late genes, alpha am the gene that encodes alpha amylase is a late gene. It takes several hours bef from the time that these cells are exposed to, to gibberellins to when alpha amylase gene starts to be transcribed. And the reason is that the transcription factors that control the expression of alpha amylase are the early genes. Those are the ones, those are the genes whose expression is turned on directly by the gibberellins. So the DELA protein is a repressor of the transcription factors. These are in, fall in this class of G, a, M, Y, B proteins. The my B proteins are a large family of transcription factors in plants. The G, A, M, Y, B proteins are gibberellic acid 
dependent transcription factors. Okay, so the presence of gibberellin releases the negative control of the, the GA my B gene. That produces the transcription factor, which is then used to turn on the transcription of gibberellin dependent genes. So alpha amylases and proteases and things like that. James. Say that again. Ah, yeah, thank you. Okay, so we'll stop there and we'll pick this up again at the beginning of the next lecture.